Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I teach voice and vocal pedagogy at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. I seem to have brought with me some um, microscopic organisms that are slowly giving everybody in Boston a cold. So in a room full of such exquisite speakers, I apologize for my speaking voice right now. Uh, NEC has a long tradition of utilizing spectrographic analysis to understand structure and timbre in music. And my work there has given me a chance to try to bridge the gap between the typical approaches used in voice science and those used in theoretical music analysis and what they call the spectral school of composition. So I kept calm and carried on, and I just finished my doctorate, and my dissertation was on, thank you very much, <laughs> my dissertation was on the topic parsing the spectral envelope toward a general theory of vocal tone color, and what I'm presenting today is, is a small excerpt drawn from that. My primary goal with this document is to attempt to integrate elements of psychoacoustics into the basic framework of the visual models that we use to describe sung vowels. Our current models, based primarily on research into speech, consider the spectral envelope of a vowel to be a sort of event horizon beyond which no meaningful discussion of timbre can really take place, save for the vague metaphors we're all familiar with, like bright, dark, warm, steely, ring, cut, and so on. We learn from linguistics that we hear a pretty wide range of variations of a vowel as the same phoneme, uh, and that context within a word helps us to decipher the intended vowel. This seems to imply that there's no such thing as an objective measurement of voice color, just various aspects of bright and dark sounds and relative relationships with one another, which then in context give rise to the phenomena that we group into categories called vowels. At the most basic level, I think we need to rethink what the inherent timbre of a continuous state sung vowel is, especially since uh, vocal acoustics now challenges us. It's forced us to consider that elite singers tune specific vocal track resonances to couple with specific harmonics, which could not be more different from the more careless alignment of resonances and harmonics that are possible in speech. So to this end, I think we may best understand the inherent timbre of a vowel and thus begin to bring specificity to the language and models used to describe the singing voice by breaking the spectral envelope apart into units that are smaller than common sense suggests exist. And by coming to understand how all these different parts of a spectral envelope um, convey unique aspects of the overall timbre and work together to create our perception of both pitch and vowel. So I propose three levels of zoom that we're going to look at with the spectral envelope uh, that generate a productive discussion of vowel perception. First of all, there's the total spectral envelope, the entire envelope. And I think this is how we tend to think about vowels, and this is what our models suggest is true. Second, there's the individual tone color of each harmonic that actually really forms that envelope. And then third, there's the tone colors of essentially topographical features of the envelope, which is just to say the spectral peaks and the valleys. Placed within a framework that helps us to locate the general physical location of the various vocal tract resonances, and I know this is a simplification, but first formant is behind the tongue hump, second formant is in front of the tongue hump. That's a lie, but it's a reasonable lie. Um, we can effectively, if we know what to listen for in the spectral envelope, we can effectively pinpoint technical deficiencies based on the timbre that we're hearing. Um, I'm going to briefly discuss the second level of zoom, but I'm going to focus primarily on this third level of zoom, which is to say these topographical details of the spectral envelope. So the psychoacoustics literature that addresses this idea is basically completely unambiguous that simple sounds have a timbral quality tied directly to frequency. They term this the scale of brightness. Low frequency sounds are dark and dull, and high frequency sounds are, are bright and um, brilliant. I argue that there are in fact absolute values along this continuum, much like invisible light. So even if the labels that we use to characterize a specific frequency are vague, we would have to say that two simple sounds of the same frequency have exactly the same vague value. They are exactly the same amount bright. So I choose to label this anthropomorphically because humans vowel. Um, so I group these sounds according to vowel labels and I call this property absolute spectral tone color. Uh, these labels basically align with the second uh, formant value for most spoken vowels. U and sometimes O are actually notable exceptions. We don't tend to think that A ah is brighter than A, ah, 
that's not necessarily the term we'd use. They both have bright in them, and they both have warm in them. They both have dark in them. Um, but we can use the phonetic label to sort of group that experience. Um, we may also think in terms of the changes of the vocal tract, and of course that's true, but I think we're comfortable with the idea that these sounds are already more complex than a simple dark, bright label can characterize. And in terms of vowel perception, it would be useless for singers to reduce a vowel to a single measure of brightness, especially at least within the classical idiom, you know, the ideal is to have darkness and brightness going on at all times. The phenomenon that I label local spectral coherence helps to explain how the ear resolves the individual harmonics absolute spectral tone color into the overall vowel. We don't hear chords of sine waves when we listen to a singer, even though that's what the models tell us is happening. Um, we hear clumps of different tone colors simultaneously. So those of you who have memorized your F1, F2, XY plot graph charts know that U and E, for example, share a common first formant. If we listen to just that part of the envelope in both vowels, we notice that they don't just share a measurable uh, frequency of that resonance, they actually share a tone color. So this is an U. This is an E. If we listen to the first formant proximal harmonics in the U, there it is. If we listen to those same harmonics in the E, it's actually identical. And I tweaked this with Mata so it would be identical to make the point. But, um, <laughs> but the way in which it would be non-identical would be subtle shades of ooh. It wouldn't be a profoundly different sound. Uh, if we listen to E without that ooh, and then fade it back in, We hear that what we're really doing is adding, we're adding an oo to the e. Okay. Um, so the thing that I think is missing from the current models we have, our spectral envelopes, our XY plot graphs, is, is basically like what is the quality of the sound of each one of these spectral peaks, not just what is its objectively measurable central frequency. If we take these two ahs, for example, and those both have identical values for F1 and F2, but by reshaping the spectral envelope of the second one, we introduce a qualitative timbral difference. It also matters if the harmonics in a peak all fall within what's called the critical band of hearing, and it matters whether they are within the portion of the spectral envelope that the cochlea can resolve into the pitch itself. I think a lot of the reasons we, that we think female voices do not have singers' formants, for example, is because any high energy harmonics that they're energizing are all resolved into the space of the pitch. With a tenor or with a baritone, the cochlea has problems doing that, and so we hear the singers' formant as a separate phenomenon, like ringing above the actual pitch being sung. But I just briefly want to close with a, a single example. So if we take this oval. I'm going to tell you that the O actually exists within these three harmonics. If we kill it, that's the rest of the envelope. Reintroduce it. And the O pops back into place. Um, now, I picked this vowel at this pitch because the second, third, and fourth harmonic each have their own different absolute spectral tone color. From bottom to top, it's like an O, like an O, like an aw. Um, and if you played a sine wave into your vocal tract, each one of those frequencies, it would pop into resonance in your oral cavity when you made the shape for those vowels. Um, the reason we hear all of these as an O is a phenomenon called the spectral centroid. It's a way to measure basically the average frequency of a group of harmonics simultaneously. Um, so these three glue together perceptually and give us one vowel-like tone color. Does this make some element of sense? Okay, good. So the reason that it is, and we can even just think about it topographically, is the lowest harmonic is the loudest. And so effectively, it, it pulls the center of gravity of those three harmonics towards itself. The center of gravity for these three harmonics together happens to be about the middle frequency. So we hear this as an O, which is the absolute spectral tone color of that middle harmonic. But we can reshape it. We can tilt it towards the top one. And get an A instead. 
no matter how loud we make that, it will never be an ah, though, because that color actually resides within this harmonic. And there's our ah. So in this way, we can begin to understand the entirety of the spectral envelope and the timbral contributions that each topographical feature brings based on its shape, where its center of gravity is, and then what the absolute spectral tone color of that harmonic would be. Um, that's all the time I have for today, but I'd be happy to field any questions. Thank you. sweeps of your voice studios and I've found some at NEC's campus that from the perspective of where the student stands there's a, a six decibel boost in the frequency range where the ah tone color exists for example compared to where the teacher sits so the teacher may like demand more and from the student's point of view they're actually they're doing it I don't know who to room EQ wizard That's a great point, absolutely. It's solely based on frequency. So if we sing an octave lower, it's a different harmonic in the series that exhibits the same tone color. If we recorded an airplane engine taking off and not filtered that same frequency of the airplane engine, it would exhibit the exact same absolute tone color. Yeah, just to put it in another plug for that room, you just talk about you can do reverberation times. Yeah. Or so could we simplify and say that we don't actually need two or three formats to the inline vowel, we just need a specific harmonic that. Well, so this gets it's a really interesting question as to how this impacts the concept of registration. Because if you go from a low sung male voice and you have multiple harmonics proximal to the first and second format, that actually imparts a complexity to the tone color that we hear from those spectral peaks. If all of a sudden you're singing a G5 and you have a single harmonic that is being amplified by you know, what was the first format two octaves lower and had four harmonics, it's a qualitatively different sound. And so a whoop, for example, whoop resonance, I think does not have a specific sound because it depends on what pitch you're singing, because as pitch rises, the tone color changes. But it does have a specific simplicity based on the fact that there are fewer harmonics being excited. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.